Then we will turn to uh, an update from our uh, Health and Human Services Division of Behavioral Health uh, regarding the implementation of our service expansion for our mental health services program. And we'll welcome Dr. Suzanne Tavano. Good morning, yeah. Suzanne. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Supervisors. Again, I'm Dr. Suzanne Tavano, Director for Behavioral Health and Recovery Services for Health and Human Services Department. So I'm here today to give you an update on a, a variety of programs. Um, they, they might seem loosely connected, but actually they all um, weave together at the end of the day to provide highly integrated services to persons with mental health and or substance use um, disorders. So um, I'll be speaking, and I will speak quickly, and I will keep it as brief as possible, but updating you on the homeless outreach team pilot, the HOT team, um, the community crisis response teams, the crisis stabilization unit, um, drug Medi-Cal waiver implementation, road to recovery, which is our new drug Medi-Cal clinic, um, a p um, prospective chronic inebriate project, our, um, some changes in our access and assessment team. Um, just a few words on AB 1421. So I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so starting with the homeless outreach team pilot, as you all know and have heard before, this is a project modeled on the San Mateo hot team. Um, it was uh, <clears throat> initiated in about February of this year, really got up and running in the spring of this year. Uh, a number of community partners are involved, the San Rafael Police Department, Marin County HHS, um, St. Vincent de Paul, Marin Housing Authority, Ritter Center, Homeward Bound, and Community Action Marin. So those are the primary partners who meet regularly. There was a lot of um, discussion going into the implementation of the HOT team and outreach by a variety of people to persons in the city of San Rafael who were homeless and seemingly at risk. There were about 15 uh, individuals identified. Of those 15 individuals, 13 consented to participate in the HOT initiative. So uh, that's pretty much where we are as of today. Um, what I would say is of those 13, uh, all 13 have been identified as having some level, some degree of either mental health or substance use disorder. Uh, ten of those are already engaged in receiving services either from mental health and or substance, uh, substance use providers. Uh, two of those individuals are suspected of having either mental health or substance use issues but have not yet been assessed and diagnosed. One, the remaining one of that 13 um, is at this point refusing contact and so there's continuing outreach and engagement going with that person. My exoskeleton keeps me going. Um, what I was going to mention also, of the, of the 13, nine are currently housed. Uh, two of them are in permanent housing. Six of them are in transitional service programs, and one's in an emergency shelter. And would also add that... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to go back for a moment here. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, what I was going to say is uh, a thank you to the board for the funding that was recently approved to um, help subsidize the HOT project. And with that will come the addition of one case manager, which is very needed to help in um, interacting with the individuals when they're out in the street and coordinating their services. So thank you very much. That's uh, about to occur in the very near future, but cannot yet announce the name of the community-based organization that will be facilitating that process. So 
twice a year, the state requires us to do a, a, what are called POKIs, Performance Outcome Quality Improvement Surveys of the clients that we serve. Um, it's a long, rather tedious uh, survey that they're asked to take, but they do. Um, but what we always find really valuable are the write-in comments that they make. And what we're finding increasingly is that what is being identified as a number one need is permanent housing. So wanted to just highlight a couple of those comments. Um, it is not a state mandate or a state requirement that um, behavioral health provide housing, but we firmly believe and are committed to helping with housing as much as possible in order to help people sustain their stability and to really move forward on their road to recovery. So we feel it's essential and we're doing everything that we can from our part of the world to, to support those efforts. So a bit of a brief update. Um, as you know from prior reports, on any given day, we are assisting about 450 people diagnosed with serious mental illness to have a roof over their head, whether it's um, supported housing, residential housing, or independent living. And then another 90 to 100 individuals um, who are receiving substance use services. So about 550 people are having some form of roof over their head by way of our efforts. We are um, continuing to um, expand that capacity. As we have reported before, we entered a contract with Progress Foundation, and um, the intent is to establish a 10 to 12 bed transitional residential program where people with serious mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorders can live and receive treatment for up to a year. We're working with the state to see if that might be expanded a little, but right now the regulations um, say one year. Um, I would say that Progress has been doing an amazing job at looking for property um, for almost eight months now and have looked um, at many houses, et cetera. It's just not working out. We really need a five to six bedroom house. Um, however, we just recently identified a potential site um, don't want to get too into much into too much detail about it, but it's very promising. And if that does work out, then we can move that project along very quickly. It's very needed. Um, also, wanted to update you on our 1.4 million dollars from the Mental Health Services Act that has been deposited with Cal HFA for the last 11 years or so. Um, thank you to the board. You agreed to um, initiate our request to have those refunds, those funds returned to Marin County. So they are now, Cal HFA is now processing all of that paperwork. As soon as we, re we have the funds returned, we have up to three years to spend them. Um, the intent and um, the majority of um, people that have been asked and responded really are in support of permanent housing. So we're hoping to find a partner in the community to help with that effort. Um, also, just a very brief update on No Place Like Home. Um, as you might recall, that was part of the state budget that was passed this year. Um, it will take 1% uh, of the Mental Health Services Act dollars off the top statewide those funds will be used to basically pay back a 20-year bond. The intent is, oops, sorry. Um, the intent is to establish uh, 10 to 14,000 new units of permanent housing for persons with serious mental illness statewide, which is a, a great endeavor. Um, we're still a bit uncertain about how Marin will fare with that. Um, priority will be given to counties with the highest percentage of homeless and also those most ready to build affordable housing. So we are not out of the game. We're going to stay in the game um, and we will see how we do. I think we're very fortunate because Supervisor Connolly is a, now a member of the technical work group and uh, Mr. Eilerman out of the CAO's office is also part of that technical work group. So we find the more involvement we have the better off we are, so that's wonderful. Um, in addition to the technical work group, um, there'll be a 14-member advisory board. The majority of those seats will be appointed by the governor, although there are some other appointing agencies also. So um, that's, that's just a brief update on No Place Like Home. I think 
as this year moves forward, we'll understand it a bit better. There's a lot of technical talk going on now, so um, I'll just leave it at that. So this is a bit of an update on our community response teams, and again, our emphasis has been on identification of people at risk and need and in need, um, outreaching to them, making very steady and consistent efforts of engagement, and then hopefully moving them into either emergency care, if that's what their need is at that time, or ongoing plan services through one of our programs. So um, the three teams, as you recall, the transition team, the mobile crisis, and the outreach and engagement. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words uh, about the funding for these programs because we're watching it closely. For outreach and engagement, um, we did fund it through the Mental Health Services Act. We feel that that's very sustainable. There's been a lot of support for the program. The mobile crisis response and the transition team, as you recall, are state grants um, from uh, Senate Bill 82. The funding is supposed to sunset in January 2018, um, but these programs statewide have become so integral in the communities that there is a lot of advocacy that the state budget continue to include ongoing funding. So we're gonna be watching that very carefully. Um, it, these teams have had a very large impact on the community. We receive a lot of feedback about how important they are and the need to continue them. So we're gonna work very hard on that. Um, not only maintain what we have, but we hear all the time that people would really like 24 seven availability, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week availability. Currently we are in operation seven days a week from one to nine, but we know that a lot of emergencies happen after those hours, so if we can expand funding, we'll expand the capacity. We're going into our Mental Health Services Act three-year planning process within the next couple of months. Given the support that I hear from community members, I anticipate that during the Mental Health Services Act planning process, there'll be a fair amount of uh, support expressed as well. So we might be able to designate some funding through the Services Act to help sustain and perhaps grow these programs. Um, so, uh, oops, I'm not a great multitasker. So um, just a little bit of the outcomes on the response teams. Um, when I reported in, in June, they were doing very well. Um, the outreach and engagement was launched in February 2015. They've now served 158 clients with 599 encounters, which is what we want to see because they are the people going out, connecting with people who to date have been hesitant or resistant to receiving services. So the fact that they're going out and having repeated contacts is very good. That's what we want to see happen. That's how relationships are built. The transition team uh, started in March 2015, has now served 312 individuals with over 2,100 encounters. Again, we want to see that because the transition team is the group that steps in once people have engaged and are interested in services, not quite ready to fully commit to a particular program or are waiting for an open available um, spot in a program. So that's short-term case management for up to two months. And then of course there's the mobile crisis response team. They've been extremely busy. Um, they've served 543 clients with 11, almost 1,200 encounters. Um, that team, along with the transition team and outreach and engagement, when there's a, a, a very significant event in the community, we basically mobilize the staff of all three of those teams. There have been some significant events, one at one of our federally qualified health centers, and we were asked to come and um, work with the staff there after a, a, an event that occurred and there have been a number of those events throughout the community. So we're, we're reaching out to individuals that are being brought to our attention, but also when there's some um, large crisis in the community, we're responding with those teams as well. So um, since June, um, in aggregate, there have been an additional 259 people served, and since June, an additional 937 services provided. So the teams continue to expand who they're seeing and how often and 
for how long they're seeing people. So, um, so crisis stabilization unit, and bear with me again, the last time I presented, I talked about changing our name from mental health and substance use services to behavioral health and recovery services. And so now I'm asking you to um, go with us as we change the name of Psychiatric Emergency Services, PES, to crisis stabilization. And I'd like to say why. Um, technically, um, our CSU, PES is not technically a psychiatric emergency service. It is not part of the hospital. It is not an emergency department. It is certified by the State Department of Healthcare Services as a crisis stabilization unit for outpatient care, not to exceed 23 hours and 59 minutes. If we reach the 24 hour mark, the state is not happy. I'll say more about that in a moment. I always walk a fine line here in being disclosing and transparent and not wanting to get into trouble. So, um, in, and, <laughs> I'm trying. Um, in 2015, there were 1,225 visits to PES. In 2016, um, we're anticipating uh, the total is going to be about 2,000. So, that's a very marked increase in the course of, course of one year. Uh, I know that three, four years ago, there may have been two to three people on the unit at any given time. There were shifts when there was no one there. That's no longer the case. There are times when there are now eight to 10 and even up to 12 people on the unit at the same time. There are people there every shift. It's no longer an intermittently utilized facility. It's constant and it's very heavily used and increasingly so. Um, as you recall, we did uh, obtain a state grant of $946,000 to improve the physical plant at CSU, um, and we are well on our way of doing that. We um, had the original plan that we had submitted to the state, which we're now working on modifying. We've been working with the staff who actually work on the unit to get their recommendations for um, physical changes. And then um, we have coordinated with Marin General. As you know, um, 250 Bonaire is jointly owned between the county and the hospital. So we coordinate with the hospital whenever we're making changes. They're fully in support. Um, we've obtained an architectural firm and some additional drawings have been rendered. Our anticipated completion date is um, late winter of 17. So we are going to stay on this. Um, fortunately, the requirement of the grant was that we complete it within 18 months. As you recall, we received the reward in about June. So we're staying on track so far, and um, we'll have some technical difficulties when we get to the point of having to move people around a bit in order to get some of the construction done. But again, remember that doing this um, will not only increase safety for staff and clients, but also will increase our capacity to appropriately accommodate them. We'll be going from four beds to eight beds for adults and from one bed to two beds for youth. So um, we've really been watching the utilization of PES and somewhat concerned about the utilization of PES, the growing numbers, the level of acuity, um, how long people are staying on the unit, and what the presenting problems are. And what was becoming increasingly clear is that a number of people, a significant number of people being brought in on 5150s to PES are coming in in a state of acute intoxication from a variety of substances. So we routinely request of clients that we do a drug toxicology screen. Um, we did a little uh, study, a three month study this summer, and of the people that were asked to um, provide a drug screen, 77% uh, 70, 70, of them agreed. Of the 77% who agreed to do the drug screening, 53% tested positive for alcohol and or drugs. When w that pie chart to the left is a breakdown of the different substances that were detected on the toxicology screen. And of course, all of them are of concern. Um, what is of particular concern to us is the 22% that were positive for amphetamines. 
And the reason I say that is people who are acutely, acutely intoxicated on amphetamines, particularly methamphetamine, present as highly agitated, sometimes aggressive, sometimes assaultive, um, very difficult to manage in the crisis stabilization unit because again, it's not a hospital. And also more challenging is that many hospitals, when we ask to admit these individuals for stabilization, many hospitals will refuse because of the very things that I just outlined, the challenges that come with the, that, the utilization of that particular drug. So it's of great concern. We're watching it closely. I've spoken to the attending staff at Marin General Hospital Unit A, and they also are saying that they're seeing a very significant um, incidence of methamphetamine in the clients they're serving. So, um, so sort of our crisis situation and our crisis stabilization unit, I think, really is related to what I am really starting to identify as a bigger crisis in Marin County, and that is the lack of hospital beds. And I know that I have said this to um, the board members before, people in the community hear me say it all the time, um, there just simply are not enough hospital beds for the residents of Marin County. We see that the um, frequency of hospitalizations is increasing, the numbers are increasing, um, but the beds are not. In some cases, they're decreasing. Uh, we're anticipating that um, for 2016, over 300 people will be hospitalized, and those are just people who are Medi-Cal beneficiaries or uninsured low-income individuals. All of the people who have Medicare and commercial insurance are not included in this number of 300, although many of them do come to CSU for stabilization, and it is out of the CSU that they are hospitalized. It's equally challenging to find a hospital bed for people with commercial insurance and Medicare. Historically, if you had commercial insurance or Medicare, you could find a bed. If you had Medi-Cal, you're going to have a harder time. Now it's across the board. So when, when I reference the 300 hospitalized for 2016, those are just Medi-Cal beneficiaries. I don't have the count of those with commercial insurance and Medicare only because we're not considered the um, payer of source, so we cannot get that information once the person is hospitalized but it greatly impacts all of us. It greatly impacts our crisis stabilization unit um, because we have so many people coming in now and it's getting increasingly hard to get them placed in the hospital where they need to be. So they're waiting on our CSU longer. As they wait longer, new people are coming in so that the volume is, that's what's contributing to the increased volume on a daily basis. Um, it not only in, impacts our crisis stabilization unit, but it really impacts every member, every resident of Marin County who needs, who is in need of psychiatric hospitalization because the beds just are not there. Of the 300 people that we, the county, were responsible for hospitalizing, about 54% are hospitalized at Marin General on Unit A, but that means the other 46% are being hospitalized at facilities in the greater, greater Bay Area, all 11 counties, plus Sacramento, and now sometimes the Central Valley, on occasion, Southern California. To me, this really describes a crisis at hand. Um, the other piece of that is uh, we're in competition with every other county who's saying the same thing to their boards that I'm saying to you today. So it is not uncommon that when someone is in CSU and needs to be hospitalized, we are um, requesting admission from at least eight different hospitals before we actually get an acceptance. And there are times when um, we offer uh, to commit to a county pay if a hospitalization could occur. Thank you again to the board for allowing that to happen. But even with that in place, the hospitals will still say no. We can't make a hospital accept an admission. It's purely up to the admitting staff and the administrative staff of the hospital. So we have no control. We have 
Our door is open, so everyone comes into CSU. We have no control of the doors that then will get them into the hospital care that they need. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and um, talk about the drug medical organized delivery system. System um, that's the 19, part of the 1915. I'm sorry, I get my uh, waivers mixed up. It's the 1115 waiver. Um, we've talked a little bit about it before here, but we're actually moving forward now. Marin was the fifth county in the state to get an approved implementation plan from DHCS and CMS and just recently had our rate structure approved. So that means we're pretty good to go. We're just waiting for the contract to come from DHCS and then we'll bring that forward to the board, hopefully for approval. Once the contract is executed, we get to implement the whole new delivery system for drug Medi-Cal benefits. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these slides. I think we're so excited about this happening. We put too many slides in and too many bullets, so I'm going to skip over a lot of them, but we are really excited. It's going to have a very big impact on the community. Um, it greatly will increase the access to services, to drug and alcohol services. It will greatly increase the kinds of services that will be available. It will allow us to move our services out into the community. We'll no longer be restricted to a building or a clinic. And we'll be um, coordinating very highly with primary care. In fact, have an MOU with Partnership Health on this in terms of roles and responsibilities and providing the drug Medi-Cal benefits. So it'll be a very integrated process. Um, there are some real advantages to it. Um, prior, if, prior to the waiver, the state basically managed all the benefits. Um, anyone could receive any services they wanted in any county. With the waiver, it basically moves the drug Medi-Cal benefit into a managed care model. We, the county behavioral health recovery services, will be the contractor of the state managing all of those benefits for the county of Marin. So we'll be able to expand capacity, expand providers. We've been working with our community-based organizations for them to increase their types of certifications they have with the state and the kinds of services they're provided. And there is so much more to it. Um, I think one thing that I do want to mention is um, there is emphasis on evidence-based practices, which is wonderful. So motivational interviewing, um, trauma-informed care, and a number of others. But also the whole model is built on using very objective criteria for determining need for services and level of services. Those are the ASAM criteria. Addiction Society, American Society of Addiction Medicine. So it gives a whole new framework when someone walks in the door asking for services, how to assess them and how to get them to the right level of care. So it's no longer one size fits all. All care should be tailored to that individual. I'll try to speed up here. Um, again, um, these are under the waiver, um, the variety of services that we'll be able to provide. Disregard the red, not the, the red uh, highlighting is, is not that significant. Basically all the services will um, be expanded with many new ones coming on. And what I'd like to mention uh, while we're on this slide is that we recently, September, hired Dr. Jeff DeVito. And I don't think Dr. DeVito is here today. We recruited him from UCSF. He is a board certified psychiatrist and is also certified in addiction medicine and certified in addiction psychiatry. So we're bringing someone who is young, smart as could be, energetic, and lives in Marin County, is very um, dedicated and committed to helping to build a delivery system that's very effective. He is very well trained in the new medication assisted treatments and we're really looking forward to him helping us build our system, really introducing and expanding the use of medication assisted treatment, particularly Vivitrol with chronic alcoholism and other medications um, for chronic opioid use. So we're really excited about having him and it's really doing a jump start to our whole process. And again, I'm not going to go over all of this. It, um, it basically, it's a chart that says under state plan, drug Medi-Cal, 
That's what's currently available. Once we get our contract and we go to the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system, on the right-hand side, that's everything that's available. So I won't repeat what I've said earlier, and I'll just leave that for everyone to peruse at their leisure. Um, and then the, um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here either, but just to reference that for the last year and a half, we have been preparing for the um, eventuality of participating in the waiver. Um, we've been expanding contracts with community-based organizations. We've been expanding the services and kind of services. We're very happy that we now have services specifically for Spanish-speaking clients. Um, we also have um, new services that are gender specific, which sometimes makes a very large difference. What we are particularly excited about right now is in Marin, there has not been either partial hospitalization or residential treatment services for adolescents with drug and alcohol problems. And under the waiver, we will be starting those services um, with some very good providers. So that's a very exciting new event. And so I'll just say something briefly here. Um, Road to Recovery, this is the name of our new um, county-operated drug Medi-Cal clinic. It's the first one operated by the county. Um, it will really specialize on treating people who have very serious mental illness and very serious substance use. What we've been finding is when people have both of those conditions at a very serious level, they, they have somewhat been falling through the cracks. Does the mental health system do it? Does the substance use system do it? And meanwhile, we're not getting the maximum care. So this is our effort to combine and truly integrate services for those highest need people. So that's um, something new and very different for us and should make a big difference. Um, so a few words on um, the pending chronic inebriate project. Um, the county HHS is um, contracting with an outside consultant to facilitate a process for um, looking at public policy and problem solving around chronic inebriates who are involved with the criminal justice system in particular. Um, so the, um, a, a number of stakeholders will be brought together. The intent is to design a system focused on helping those with a pattern of chronic alcohol use and repeated criminal justice involvement and will implement a system featuring alternative sense, hopefully alternative sentencing, um, really moving very strongly into harm reduction based models of treatment and expanding medication assistant treatment, particularly Vivitrol um, in the use of chronic alcoholism. And we are working already with um, uh, jail health, detention health, because we think that it will be very beneficial for people who are being arrested for um, crimes related to chronic alcoholism while they're incarcerated with their consent to start them on Vivitrol so that when they are released from custody, they're already on their way to stabilization. So that'll be something new and different and very beneficial. Um, Let's see, just very quickly, um, I mentioned that we were redesigning the adult services system. We've done that now. There's a highly integrated multidisciplinary team at Kerner, same thing at Bonaire. What we've also done at Bonaire is um, consolidate a lot of services, really starting with access all the way through crisis. So on the first floor at Bonaire, we have a large multidisciplinary um, outpatient clinic for ongoing services. On the second floor of Bonaire, we've moved our assessment, our access and assessment team, and also our housing home base for our mobile crisis teams. And of course, that's the site of our crisis stabilization unit. So in that building, there will be every level of care with high coordination. And um, really the intent is to enhance outreach, engage people, wherever they, whatever door they walk in and then provide that level of service. The other thing that's new and different is starting November 1st, um, our access team will be doing walk-in assessments, so no need to call and make an appointment. It's really service on demand. 
which is a great way for our system to go. It's very challenging for many people that we see to be at a particular place at a particular time if they're dependent on public transportation and a whole variety of other things. So um, this is our first step at creating um, treatment on demand. So as you can see, November 1st we're starting and it'll be Wednesdays from 9 to 2, 9 a.m. to 2 and on Fridays from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. And if that's successful, then we'll look at ways of expanding that capacity. So again, just want to always include the numbers on how to reach us. If you or anyone you know is in need of service, those are posted. And again, going back to the pokey, um, we do look at the comments people write in. I think we need some um, sense of gratification at times and it's always good to hear from the people we're serving that they think we're doing a good job. So um, just, you know, just a few little examples on that. Um, want to just really briefly, AB 1421, as we committed to the board, we'll be coming back in February to continue the discussion of um, AB 1421. But in the meantime, um, I, I've been actively um, talking with other counties who have been implemented, uh, who have already implemented. I've been looking at their outcome measures. Um, we're monitoring any evidence that, any new evidence that might be emerging from the literature uh, regarding 1421. Um, we're really looking to the counties of Orange, San Diego, and LA. They're contracting with universities to actually do outcome studies and performance measures and hopefully we'll get some good objective empirical data out of those studies that we would certainly want to take into consideration in Marin. And um, we're continuing to expand our evidence-based programs. We've continued to expand the capacity of the Odyssey program as directed by the board um, in June. And um, that's about it there, I would say, in terms of uh, recommendations. Oops. So in terms of recommendations, so from my clinical perspective and perspective of being director of, of the current services, I really feel that if the county were to prioritize the needs of the community, it would be number one, ensuring access to timely hospital care. It is so crucial, it impacts hundreds of Marin residents. The next is, as we all know, um, improving access to permanent housing. I think we're doing a good job at transitional housing and supported housing, but in, at, at the end of the day, permanent housing is what's needed. Um, we hope to increase our hours of operation of the community response teams, as mentioned before, and we feel that we want to continue to expand the capacity of our full service partnerships, which are the evidence-based practices that are at the core of treatment for 1421. And um, before we end, if I could just, your patience and indulgence, I, I would like to introduce Eileen DeMarco, if she could come up and just say a couple of words. And I'll let Eileen speak for herself, but Eileen is a participant in our Odyssey program, and I think a lot of times I come and I kind of talk on and on and on, and it's not necessarily uh, real to the people that are involved. So I just asked Eileen if she would come and just say a few words about her personal journey. Certainly, and maybe you can help her by pulling that microphone a little closer and, and punching the button that turns the light on. That uh, it's on, it's on. Okay. okay, great. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I was raised here in Marin since 1960 and um, wasn't prepared for all the things that were gonna happen to me in life. A lot of traumas, a lot of setbacks, and a lot of losses, and depression setting in, and anxiety, panic attacks. And by the time I was about 42, I was literally straight up on the street after having a good healthy work record of working for Safeway Rayleigh's in the pharmacy and, and uh, Motorola and they sold out and we had a downsize and everything just plummeted. And I wasn't, didn't think I was gonna make it until I was 50. And uh, growing up here, I ended up 
on the streets here, and I figured I was going to die here. And somewhere, somebody took me to AB 2034, and they took me in an, as a client. They started offering me a psychiatrist, started helping me with medication, then I got a doctor, then I got a therapist, then the therapist started helping me with other programs, then they offered me other programs that had housing, like a Shelter Plus Care and Buckaloo. Um, Linda Reed at the time had um, uh, um, alcohol and drug recovery program, which no longer is there, but they started offering me all these programs and all these classes and all these tools that would start helping me with my own anxiety without pills and, and start growing. I mean, I was just a being. I was just merely existing out there. And they started kind of like weaving me together with all these different things and actually started making a human being out of me. And it's taken a long time, but um, I don't think you would have liked to have me sit up here 12 years ago and speak to you then. Um, they have been so patient and so kind with me. And the different programs that I've gotten into, even my therapists have started classes on mindfulness and just making me become, again, another part of society to the point where I'm able to get up here and speak to you. So. All I can say is that I know I'm not the only one that has come this far. I know it's taken a while, but I know a lot of other people are grateful for the chance to be with AB 2034. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here, and certainly congratulations on your own progress. Thank uh, you. It's very helpful for us, and I'm sure others who are watching uh, who aren't here with us today, and even those who are in the audience, to see that there can be progress. It's slow. It requires your will, but also a lot of support. Oh, it does. Well done. It takes a lot of support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor. I will take questions from board members or comments, and then we'll open it up for public comment, uh, beginning with uh, Supervisor Arnold and then Supervisor Rice. Great. Thank you. Um, really in-depth presentation. Thank you for that, Doctor. Um, is the slideshow you did available to us? Uh, yes. Okay, the uh -huh. PowerPoint. I yes, mean, it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So if you could send that to us, either email or print it and send it, that would be great. Um, and um, I had another question, two questions more. What percentage of mental health patients um, are addicted to alcohol and or drugs? Yeah, that that's a great question, and that's just something that we're starting to study and analyze at this time. What, what we know is when, when DJ and I have our conversations about this and we think about the Venn diagrams, we know that a large number of people who have drug and or alcohol um, issues also have a fair amount of mild to moderate mental health needs. Mm -hmm. Relatively few have serious mental health. When we look at the other Venn diagram, of people with serious mental illness, it really changes dramatically where we estimate, the conservative estimate is about 55%, but it's probably closer to 70% mm -hmm. of the people with serious mental illness also have drug and or alcohol use. And that's why we've been working so hard to have more integrated mm -hmm. services because those people with serious, very serious mental illness and that um, level of substance use don't usually fit easily into traditional substance use programs. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've started with PES, looking at the incidents there, and we've just met with um, almost 100 of our clinical staff yesterday for documentation training, and we emphasize the importance of not only diagnosing the mental health condition, but the substance use mm -hmm. um, disorders as well, and having them appear on the assessment so that we can better examine that further. So in other words, the causation seems to be mental illness causes alcohol, m a higher percentage rather than someone who is addicted to alcohol then becomes mentally ill. Is that what you're saying? So that's the chicken or the egg okay. question. I don't know if I'm All prepared right, to answer it. What I would say, though, is um, and, and maybe um, I think you, you heard a little a bit of it from Eileen. Um, if you're having significant mental health symptoms and you're not getting the help that you need, 
it is not uncommon to start self-medicating yourself. Mm -hmm. And self-medicating mm -hmm. may be alcohol, self-medicating may be other drugs. Mm -hmm. So what comes first or second? And, and then conversely, there are some substances, and again, I, I sound like a broken record about methamphetamine, but methamphetamine is one of the substances where a person may start out using meth and with chronic um, excessive um, use yeah. will develop organic right. deficits that right. will really appear as right. psychotic features. Thank you. So then my last question is, it sounds like the, the number one need right now is our hospital beds. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Rice. Thank you, Dr. Tavano. And I, I too would like to have a copy of the um, presentation. And it, it's full. I mean, I, I appreciate the comprehensiveness of it. It's okay if it was long as far as I'm concerned. But I would have loved to have had that PowerPoint up here mm -hmm. just to make some notes on and go back to questions. So I have a couple questions. I have more than a couple questions, but I'm going to limit it to just a and, couple. And just to share with you, we'll, we'll post it on our website as well. Got it. Yeah, and, and my apologies because we, okay. we, we did submit it, um, but I don't know why it didn't get to, to all of you. <laughs> We're just used to being hand-fed. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll bring copies <laughs> next time. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so um, with regards to uh, PES slash CSU, CSU? CSU. Okay. So when, and, and you explained the numbers going up, but, and um, there's different causes for that, but Regardless of the numbers, what I'm wondering, when you say there was 1,225 visits, I think you said 2015, of those visits, how many are, how many unduplicated individuals is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'll get that information because for you. it is you. a lot of the same. Some people have repeat visits, yes. Okay, well, I think that's really important okay. information to have. Yes. And then you also talked about, and you mentioned, the, um, in fact, in the consent calendar today, we approved the... Um, uh, funding for the architectural work for the uh, modifications to um, CSU to allow for those voluntary as well as inv expansion on the voluntary as well as involuntary spots. How, um, so, and, and, but we still, you talked about sort of the log jam there. There's nowhere for sometimes folks to go afterwards. So t tell, if you can, short answer, if there is a short answer, what happens when, you know, you maybe you do stabilize someone, but maybe they need care, they need hospitalization, or they need s okay. something else when they walk out the doors of PES as a voluntary or involuntary okay. um, patient, what happens? So um, it, it sometimes occurs that we're waiting long enough for a hospital bed to become available that the stabilization actually occurs while they're on the crisis stabilization unit, and then the hospital, of course, is not necessary. Um, in most instances, when that occurs, we use Casa Renee as a crisis residential. That's for up to 30 days, so that it's a highly structured treatment program. It's not a locked hospital, but it's a safe, secure, structured, where there's a full treatment team. Um, our nurse practitioners and docs go over for medications and so forth. Um, if people have Medi-Cal or are uninsured low income, and they're already receiving services from us, we really work to get them back to their planned services. Sometimes we'll ask the outreach and engagement team or one of the three crisis teams if we think they're not quite going to make it to their next appointment to go out, connect with them in their community, really help them get back in for their scheduled care. If they're not already being seen by us and if they meet our criteria for specialty mental health, then we really work with getting into them into one of our services. Um, if they are exhibiting mild to moderate symptoms, then we work closely with Partnership Health and Beacon to make the referral over to them. Okay, so what if they don't qualify for, what, what if they, they are self-insured or they don't? If they have commercial insurance or and Medicare or don't qualify only? qualify for whatever. We're very limited. So um, folks are walking out the door. We, can, we basically can advise them who their insurer is and how to contact them. I think 20 or 25 percent of the calls that we get to our access line are actually from people with either Medicare or commercial insurance. They don't know how to access their own services. I think for a future presentation, it would be good for us to understand how many of the folks who are coming in, uh, knocking on our doors, actually um, we're not mandated and or don't have the resources be and aren't mandated to cover, just so we understand that population. Sure. And then on the um, 
on the, I can't remember what you called it, the new uh, walk-in assessment. Yes. Um, I would suggest that only being open two days a week for a window of three hours at a time is akin to an appointment um, that you might have a hard time getting to. You said that you want to have walk-in mm -hmm. because sometimes it's hard with for people who are having difficulties to actually make an appointment. Th uh, two three-hour windows during the course of a week is not much different than a set appointment date. So I would um, suggest that you uh, ask or request or ask of us or Matthew or somebody um, for the capacity to expand that walk-in access in this pilot stage because I don't think you're going to get a, a good read on actually Thank you. The value of it, um, and/or that the, the community is not going to get the benefit of it. And then I said I'd only ask two questions, but I'm going to ask one more question. Um, when we talked about AB 1421 um, at the beginning of the year, and the presentation, as I recall, um, um, had a slide or included information about um, basically a population we've identified as potentially qualifying for um, AB 1421 and or at least really needing services and, and not, not getting them. And we had a number and I think it's a population there and I, I'm hoping that you're tracking that population because that's one of the, we want to see that progress is being made with that population. I think that's one of the things we're really going to be looking for in that presentation yes. come February. Um, and then that's all I have for now, but I, I see you working so hard to expand capacity at all levels of care within the system and the challenges are enormous and the demand is great. Um, and so I thank you for your hard work and, and all of your staff, but we've got a long way to go as do many other communities. Yeah, and we thank you for the support of the board to do it. <laughs> thank you, uh, Supervisor Conley. Thank you, also wanted to really commend you for that detailed presentation. Um, couple things. Um, one, as you noted, with uh, uh, people who present at the crisis stabilization unit, almost invariably they have a dual diagnosis of an acute uh, mental crisis but also substance abuse. Um, what we're hearing in that regard is in programs like uh, the chronic ine inebriate initiative, that if there is also a mental health um, uh, piece in the diagnosis, that that presents difficulties in terms of participation in that program. And I know historically there have also been uh, breakdowns in terms of funding streams uh, based on whether it is a um, mental health-based program or alternatively a substance abuse-based program. I think you share the goal of, of breaking down those silos in terms of funding and programmatically. So I, I'm wondering if you can comment on what kind of progress is being made in, in both those regards. Sure. Um, you're absolutely right. The, though the, the, at the national level and the state level, everything is integrate care, integrate care. Um, they've continued to keep the funding in very siloed and separate. And also, we're still struggling with 42 CFR, which are very strict privacy rules around um, persons receiving substance use services. So there are some um, challenges that require a lot of advocacy at the state and national level uh, to break down. Um, that said, we're working around those as, as best as we can, and by um, opting in to the drug Medi-Cal waiver is really crucial to that because that will really allow us to provide a much wider range of services, including case management and recovery services, and will allow us to have the staff from a drug Medi-Cal program actually go in and work within a mental health program. So that is part of the intent on the Road to Recovery program, is that staff will be working at um, out of their um, certified site, but will also be going and being embedded in the treatment teams for the full service partnerships and the two um, integrated adult teams as well. Okay, great. Um, second and last question on AB 1421, um, which as you know has been an interest of mine as well. I am looking forward to the, the greater um, update and discussion in February. 
I will say, I mean, my perspective continues to be, though, as, as I saw and heard about the great programs uh, that we're doing today in terms of the mobile crisis units, um, our full service partnership approach to delivering care, um, I still am not perceiving those to be mutually exclusive to adopting an AB 1421 type program. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to really be asking the questions on is why cannot that be a, a tool in the toolbox, so to speak? Sure. I understand that. And I think, I think what we'll be looking at when, when we um, compare what's going on in the different counties that are already up and running and doing empirical research on, on it, uh, remember from our last presentation, what, what, the, what the research has shown, the evidence has been that what has been effective is the assertive community treatment, which is the full service partnership. The part that has not been discreetly measured in an empirical way is what's the value of the black, what's the black robe value. And I'm hoping that with these counties that are now up and going and doing some empirical research, there'll be some determination about the, the impact of the black robe. What I would say is um, in talking with a number of directors last week and just informally, the great majority, the, the huge majority of people who are referred in, call in, actually go no further than voluntary services and a very, very small number actually go to court order. Um, so I think that'll be interesting to see when we have their reports. I know a number of them are doing um, updates to their boards in the upcoming months, so we'll have that to present as well. Thank you. Supervisor Sears. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a very helpful yeah. presentation. I wanted to come back to the crisis stabilization unit uh, for a moment. You noted the, the facility is constantly being used and increasingly so, and I'm trying to understand, if we can, what exactly is going on there. Are we seeing an uptick in mental health issues? Are we seeing an uptick in methamphetamine use that's perhaps driving more people to the CSU? Is there something else going on? Is it the backlog of the crisis that you talked about of finding hospital beds? What's What's I, happening? I think it's all of that. Yeah. Um, I think that the mobile teams um, the the intent of those teams was to reduce visits to crisis stabilization units, um, but we're finding that not to be the case, but also feel okay about it because they are doing what we were hoping they would do is just go out, receive a phone call from anyone, uh, you know, regarding concern about a particular individual, go out, really look for them, really try to engage with them. If they look as if they're in acute distress, then they really facilitate the transfer to the crisis stabilization unit. So on the one hand, I am a firm believer in the lowest restrictive level of care, but if someone does meet the criteria for hospitalization, they, they should receive hospital care. So I think our mobile teams are out there identifying people who previously were going unidentified and at risk. Um, I think also there's been a more concerted effort in some cities um, for people to be um, picked up on 5150s and brought over to the crisis stabilization unit, and that's where we're sorting more issues out. And then, of course, when we can't find a hospital bed and we're holding people waiting for a bed, that's adding to the capacity issue. Right. Yes. So, the, so the good news of this story is that more people are accessing the services that we have to provide, and, and that is a good news piece of it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would like to see us, um, echoing my colleague Supervisor Rice, be able to expand our hours of service as much as we can across the board if, if we are actually reaching people better than we did in the past. And, and, provi and so continue to expand the access as we're able to. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just a couple questions here for myself. Um, the community assistance team that you discussed at the beginning of the presentation, going out and meeting folks in the field. Yes. Right? Those are our employees because we also have uh, contractual relationships with other nonprofits. So we, this is our own uh, workforce. Is that right? So, so the, the three team, the three mobile teams, yeah. outreach and engagement, mm -hmm. transition, yes. and mobile crisis are a combination of county employees, um, the peer providers, and the family partners are contracted through either um, Community Action Marin or the um, San Francisco Mental Health Association. 
Um, so it's a it's a blend. They're blended programs, um, but we are very actively working with um, human resources here in Marin to establish. Um, new classifications that recognize people with lived experience as important service providers. And we've gotten pretty far down the line at creating a new classification system. So hopefully we'll be able to directly employ more people with lived experience. Okay. That's a very good thing. Um, second, under the chronic inebriate program, could you just explain its relationship to the STAR program that we've had for a number of years? So um, I think the chronic inebriate, meaning the transition program, the KG program, <laughs> it's had a number of names, the 10-person house in San Rafael. Well, I think what you were talking about were folks with chronic uh, problems that also have uh, found themselves in relationship with the law. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry. So um, I, I think we'll have to clean up our, our terminology because if you remember historically, um, there were 10 or 12 people identified as um, chronic alcoholics with justice involvement, so it was being referred to as KG. And then there was funding for the 10-person house um, in San Rafael, and they named themselves, that's contracted to um, Centerpoint, they named themselves the transition program. So apart from that 10-person program, yeah, this will be a larger stakeholder process that's facilitated by an outside consultant to really look at our policies, procedures, our services, um, and how we might expand services across the board, not just restricted to those 10 that are in the transition program. And do, do, does your department have direct involvement with the STAR program? The STAR program is directly operated by the county, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, we all looked at the Mental Health Services Act uh, being, some of it being redirected to create a housing bond that was approved this year. Um, are you doing any work to try to be competitive uh, when those opportunities come forward? So um, I'm, I'm really hoping that Supervisor Connolly is going to be effective in working on behalf of Marin. Um, but I have been in touch with um, local legislators, and I have been in touch with someone at um, Cal HFA, I, yeah, uh, CHAFA, mm -hmm. um, regarding this. There's going to be some smaller amount of money that should be available to every county. It's the larger sums that are going to be for the housing developments. Um, it, this is really going to be a community effort, and it's going to be the will of the community is what it will come down to, because what it means is more affordable housing in the county. Right. Uh, well, you, you know the old saying about the early b uh, bird gets the worm, right? Well, I, I think we really need to identify and proactively yeah. identify a site so that it, we are ready when those opportunities come. If we don't yeah. have a project, we don't have a prayer. Yes, I agree. And I think the way we're going to be walking into this is um, by getting that $1.4 million back from the state so that we can start looking for some community partners, developers, contractors to partner with and hopefully build on that. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. So we'll open it up for public comment at this time. If folks want to come forward. Um, we'll have um, up to three minutes per speaker. Welcome. Hi. I'm Maya Gladstern. I wear many hats. You have appointed me to be uh, one of the consumers on the mental health board. And um, I want to uh, say how impressed we are with the expansion of services. It's a cornucopia of opportunity out there for people who are uh, being challenged to be able to find some help in different ways. Um, I also wanted to uh, explain something about the challenge with hospital beds, is that there's no central database of beds, and so, that staff have to spend their time calling each hospital and asking if there's an empty bed. And, it's, and, it's, and hospitals sometimes say yes and sometimes say no. And um, it, it's something that needs to really be done on a regional basis or statewide basis or something like that to, to get a centralized database for that. Um, also, uh, appreciate the fact that the um, I have to change the name, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services staff, that there's a lot more diversity among the staff members, and so we really appreciate that. 
And then also um, the new peer specialist job class that are, that's being created. It's, it's um, really important because individuals with lived experience now who are working for contract agencies are not getting benefits and they're not getting paid very well. And it leads to a two-tier system where you have clinical people employed by the county and then these contracted out positions and um, there's a lot of people who are complaining about that, that they can't even afford to get therapy for themselves now. And they, are, they do have lived experience. Um, and, and I hope that when you do that, putting on another hat, that, that the job class will be represented by a union so that they will have representation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, board. Um, my name is Barbara Alexander, and uh, what am I going to say? Well, I want to start out first by saying that this was a huge amount of stuff to uh, process uh, without any kind of prior, you know, information or anything like that. So um, I'm glad. Thank you, Matthew Heimel, for doing this. He's a good guy. <laughs> so our loved ones continue to die prematurely because Laura's law has not been implemented in Marin. A case in point is Melvin Pete. You've all probably heard his name by now. He's been in the paper a lot. His death has. Melvin has cost Marin millions of dollars over the course of the last 20 years. He was really a victim of the failed system of mental health and substance abuse, the same system that we have in place today. Would, outpatient, would assisted outpatient treatment wor have worked for Melvin? He was a pretty tough case. Maybe the combination of intensive case management and nudging from the court would have, but we'll never know now, of course. I wrote, I wrote all of you about Melvin and Renee Bailey, the woman who died all alone at night behind Montecito Shopping Center. She was severely mentally ill and a substance abuser. I mean, did she really have to die like that? That's pretty awful. I also wrote to you about the clearly mentally ill man and clearly homeless looking man masturbating on the streets at 10.30 in the morning at 4th and B streets. Thank God school is in session so no children were uh, treated to this spectacle. Um, how is he not captured by the hot net? This was just two weeks ago. Maybe he's on the list of people that won't respond. And hot is doing an admirable job. Originally, they had identified 100 people as problems. And remember, the hot team now is only for San Rafael, so all the rest of the county is not being helped by the hot team. Uh, originally, there were these 100 people. They now have 13 off the streets. That means there's 87 more to go. So we need every tool we can get, and Laura's Law is truly just another tool, especially since we hear there are no hospital beds why not come early, get people into assisted outpatient treatment so they don't have to end up being hospitalized? So a certain logic there. San Francisco, San Diego, and San Mateo have added Laura's Law to augment their uh, hot programs because there, again, was this need. So I think it's time for us to join the other 18 California counties and give HOT a tool they, that they can use. Right now, the small rural counties are trying to figure out a way to combine their resources. They have so many fewer resources than we do um, to offer Laura's Law to their severely mentally ill. Over 10,000 people in Marin want to see the severely mentally ill provided with treatment that works for them. The people want it, and we need it, and everything benefits, so the time is now. So thank you so much for listening once again. <laughs> thank you. Hello, thank you for <clears throat> having this space for uh, us to come forward. Uh, I'm a parent of a son who has been homeless for seven years. He was in the Shelter Plus Care program, and he allowed people to come in to, to use, and he was warned, and they kicked him out of Shelter Plus Care. Tom was diagnosed s a schizophrenic, years and years ago. So he was kicked out, and regardless of all the programs that are available, and I am grateful for the ones that are improving, 
he does not consider himself one of them. And he will not go to any, any appointments that I make for him. And you can imagine how, man, how many I have made over the years, but he never shows up. He, he's also uh, an alcoholic and uh, uses marijuana. He is becoming more and more angry and frustrated. And he has warned one of his friends. He's been very, uh, starting to get aggressive. <sighs> All that you've read in the newspapers about guns, people shooting each other. I don't want you to allow, to allow that to possibility in Marin County with those that do not go forward for help. And that is, that is the, the possibility of uh, Laura's Law. Not, even though the possibilities are there, there's some that do not take advantage of it. Laura's law would require that they be taken in, taken in and legally require them to get uh, diagnosed and get service. Please pass Laura's law. Hi everyone, my name is Donna Morris and um, my son is severely mentally ill, um, paranoid schizophrenic. Um, he has been homeless for going on about four years and he was in serious trouble about five years ago um, and he did the star court and um, that's why I believe the, the uh, black robe concept could really work because he, um, I told him that if he didn't do the Star Court program, that I was not going to help him anymore. So he did that, and he did really well. He did everything he was supposed to do, and you know, he they found him housing. It was just unbelievable. Um, but as soon as he did not was not required to be in the program anymore, like he graduated, he um, got off his meds and he's been severely ill ever since. He sleeps up in the hills, and I do appreciate all these programs, but it doesn't help the people that don't know they have a mental illness, which is called anosognosia, and it's a serious part of the illness, so he will not accept any of the help that's out there for him. And, um, I have called the care team three many times, and Kate is on the uh, care team three, which is in the Vato, and that's where he hangs out. And she agrees that really there's nothing that any of these programs can do when someone is that ill and doesn't know anything's wrong with him. Um, he needs to have uh, hernia surgery, and um, you know I, he's just falling apart. He's getting worse and worse, and now he's being belligerent to some of the people in the public. He's been kicked out of places now, which means there's nowhere like he can even hang out. He doesn't go to San Rafael. Um, he won't go to the um, St. Vincent de Paul because he thinks someone might stab him there. So he's in jeopardy of, you know, being hungry and um, he, he is as on SSI, but within two weeks he has no money left because he is a heavy pot smoker. And that's how he self-medicates himself. So, um, of course it's a longer story than that. He's in fantasies now that he's gonna sue this company and that company that he used to work for and get a bunch of money. So he will not, you know, like the Odyssey program, Kate has talked to him about that and he will not seem to reach out to um, the people that can help him with that. So I just believe that if he was mandated to show up in court, I actually believe it would be a relief to him um, because he's really suffering and he can't find a place to live because of his illness. Thank you. Um, no one's gonna rent to him. Thank you.
Good morning, Raleigh Katzmer Association of Public Employees. As you know, we represent most of the staff in the county mental health programs, and I, d I wanted to address two points. First, on the issue or discussion about um, employee people with lived experience peers, uh, Dr. Tavano and I are both very familiar. We're familiar with the system in another county where folks in those types of positions are in county classifications working uh, side by side with professionals belonging to the same union, having all the benefits of representation, benefits, et cetera. Secondly, I wanted to comment on the crisis stabilization, PES. Uh, we have members who work there, and uh, with all due respect, at this point, it may change in the future, but at this point, the name change, I think, is a distinction without a difference as to what really is happening on the ground. As Dr. Tavano outlined, there's been an increase in the number of patients, the acuity, the amount of people who are intoxicated, which has created a great deal of safety problems for both staff and patients. Uh, we've been meeting with management about those, but we have a number of concerns about that, including whether the levels of staffing are sufficient to address the, the significant level of services that are needed and the safety and challenges to staff that exist because of that. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have a son who if you remember last time. Um, he also has a nose of nausea, I believe, because he, he was 5150 after living in his car for two years, and um, he went in the Odyssey program. He, um, I believe he, you know, being there, he was, I believe he was medicated. Um, I also believe he has a nose of nausea and doesn't think he needs any help. And um, he left the um, program and cleared everything out that he owned, and he is back to living in his car for the last year now. And he does not communicate with anybody, nobody in the family. Um, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> oh, God. I just see this as if nothing happens, it's going to be a lifelong <laughs> thing like this, not only for me, but for other family members. And we have to go through this our whole lives with them. And it's like it's mourning our family members who are still living yet are dead in a way. <sighs> they don't communicate with us. And um, I did, thank you, Dan, I did follow what you told me to do when um, there weren't enough people or we didn't get anybody to go out to, um, to him when my husband and I uh, found him um, like about nine times. And um, so once we did call a mobile crisis and um, we waited, it would, took two hours, but that's okay. There was somebody who came out there after two hours. He was out at Hamilton. And um, the person went up to him after my husband said he's in his car over there and um, and his name is Joel. And she went up to him and asked him, what is your name? Is your name Joel? No, he said, no. She wanted to give him her card, but he just waved her away. No, and, you know, he doesn't need it, no. Well, that's the last time that we saw him. Um, we're not aware that um, anybody went out there again to look for him. Um, I, I believe the care team, though, they have been looking, but our son is like become a recluse in his car. That's, that's it. And I only wish that um, she'd asked him to maybe step out of his car because when he was 5150, um, when he was 5150, that was after him living in his car two years, uh, he was malnourished. He couldn't even stand up straight. He, his arm was all bent out of shape because of sitting behind the driver's seat 24-7 and just sleeping there. And his car was filled with some food but not eaten. So I don't know. He may be going to get food, but we don't know if he's eating it. Um, Thank you for your comments. That's all. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm not here on behalf of my brother, my younger brother. Uh, gosh, it's, it's 
hard to know what to say exactly. Um, when I saw you, sir, I immediately thought that you looked just like my brother. And we go through that all the time, wherever we are. We look around and we see someone that looks like Joel. And I mean, he was 26 when he just left. He used to be um, the, the straight A student. He was always neat and tidy. And, he had so many friends, people around him that loved him. And when he left, his friends were calling him and calling us trying to find out what happened. They couldn't get a hold of him because he stopped talking to everybody, our family, his friends. He's just in his car. And he needs help. And he needs, he needs more help. My family, they drive around every day looking for his green Jeep. Can you imagine driving every day looking for your son, your daughter, your family member every day. Oh, there's a green Jeep. There's someone who looks like our, our family member. Can we, go and, can we go and see them? Are they OK? Are they getting dental? Are they getting doctors? Are they getting nutrition? Are they getting food, water? How are they? Every time you're eating something or drinking something, are they able to as well? And you just, my parents have called and called every time they do find him, every time they do see him, and people are not able to go and check in on him. The people that are supposed to be here, there aren't enough people. They're, they're not able to get to him. And this is six years now, and we, we do need more means. We need more help. Laura's Law is something that can help, then that would be great. And please pass some, some more things to help all these children. This is a great representation of, of family members who have loved ones out there with mental health issues. And there this isn't even as many people out in Marin. Um, this, is, this is a good representation. But we, there's so many people out there that have family members out there, and I will leave it at that because I'm shaking too much. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow, it's hard to talk after hearing that. Um, Good morning, supervisors. Um, I have in my hand, actually it's in a box, over 10,000 signatures in here of concerned citizens and your constituents in Marin County who support Laura's Law. We collected these in a three month period between May and July. They are concerned because many with serious mental illness in our community are still not receiving services. One of the people on this list is Congressman Jared Huffman who fully supports implementation of Laura's law. He also stated that the political winds are changing in Washington toward mental health reform. Everyone needs to support AB 2646, helping the Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. The more than 10,000 constituents of Marin County would like to see the political winds change here. It's time to stop kicking the can down the street waiting for people to die and a tragedy to occur. Laura's Law is another tool which intervenes before a 5150 or hospitalization, meaning you won't need all the beds because they intervene before they get to that point and give them extensive, intensive outpatient treatment to those who need it most for an extensive amount of time. For the record, in February, we don't only want a meeting with Health and Human Services. We would like, we the people, the more than 10,000 people would like a substantial meeting not run by staff where it's not a last minute three, three day notice. We want everyone present at the table, not only the status quo. Thank you. And each one of these pages have more than 15 people. They're all from Marin County and they're not just people who have family members with mental illness. There are people who live in your community who are concerned about the serious mentally ill not being treated. I can't even hold it. It's so heavy. 
Thank you. Supervisors, Frank Ager, Fairfax. As a long time elected and appointed Marin public official, I have found boards, commissions, and councils follow their staff and consultants' decision almost to a T. You know, I don't know if that's out of sense of loyalty or because some electeds do not do their own independent investigations. Marin General Hospital, Marin General is building a new hospital that will eventually cost our taxpayers a billion dollars when it's completed. Marin General will not add any new or additional beds in the, in the yet to be built mental health unit. They currently provide mental health beds to other counties and that's one of the reasons they are full today. Marin General Hospital must be a partner with Marin County. You, I mean, you, you, need, you need them and they need you. Laura's Law is le needed in Marin. I urge you to override your staff's decisions and implement Laura's Law as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Hello, Supervisors. My name is Jack Lieberman. My adult son has schizophrenia and will soon be a candidate for Laura's Law. He has no insight into his illness and will not take his meds. I facilitate a NAMI support group for family members of the mentally ill. I would like to know the real reason behind the reluctance to implement Laura's Law. As a retired math teacher, I know full well that numbers can be made to supply evidence for almost any argument. Over the last five years of my involvement with NAMI, I've met many family members whose loved ones never make it into the statistics. So I ask you, again, what is the real reason you are so adamant in your refusal to adopt an additional tool to help those suffering, uh, those people suffering with severe mental illness? Thank you. Hello, supervisors. <clears throat> My name is Pam Drew. I'm on the uh, Novato City Council. And I have uh, been reading for the last year, trying to understand the complexities that you're facing here. We're very thankful that uh, Damon Conley has a, a tremendous interest. And from the questions that you ask, I understand that the rest of you have the same sort of interest, maybe, not implemented as um, fully as Damon's is. We are looking at mental illness as a disease, but we are not treating mental illness as a disease. We are working with people whose severe mental illness has been developing over some years, and we are treating them with a drop-in program once in a while. We're treating them with an occasional uh, contact with a streets team or with um, the, the wonderful Laura Murphy from San Rafael. Uh, we have some great things that are happening, but whenever we look at our actual system, it is old-fashioned, it is antiquated, and there are not cracks in it, just cracks like little cracks in the sidewalk. The people who are falling through the cracks in our system are falling through cracks as big as a Mack truck. And the impression that you get whenever everything is so tidily presented in PowerPoints and so on is that we are doing as much as we can. We are doing a great job with the resources that we have. But in fact, the job that we are doing is entirely inadequate. Look around you right now. Look at everyone in the room. See how clean and together everybody is. See how quiet they are. See how they can uh, sit here and wait. See how they can converse about problems and about systems and so on. Well, very few of the people that you see here, I, I probably, 
I wager about zero, are the sorts of people that you're treating in your system. In your system, you are only able to contact really the people who are the most damaged, the people who keep getting damaged more and more with every psychotic break or every binge, binge drinking, mental illness. I was with Laura this last week. We saw a man who was a chronic inebriate. Uh, he was curled up beside the sidewalk. She very respectfully talked to him and, and um, implored him to get up so that she could see if he was all right. We did get down to St. Vincent de Paul's, and he was turned away at St. Vincent de Paul's because he was drunk. There are two dry beds at Helen Vine. The uh, chronic inebriate program was studied in 2013, and the biggest thing that was identified was the need for a, a center, a detox center that would take much larger numbers of people. I didn't even so much as hear that. We're, we're doing the same thing again in 2016 as we were doing in 2013. Thank you for your comments. Yes, and thank you for your concern and in the hope that you will double or triple somehow the resources that are available and that are needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, Dr. Tavano, thank you. And uh, the board has committed itself to reviewing with you the uh, program under the law in February, and we will look forward to having more conversation at that time. Thank you very much.